PowerPoint? Yep, go. Good. Hello, my name is Misty Trumbull, and I'm going to talk to you today about the duplication of the inferior vena cava in its applications with the computed tomography, or computed tomography's applications with this pathology. IVC duplication is a rare anomaly that occurs in only 0.2% to 3% of the total general population. The duplication of the IVC, this is a diagram of it, and as you can see, this would be normal. This is not normal. So when you look at a normal inferior beta cava, you only have one. Duplication means you have a second one. <laughs> now the course of the patient that I imaged in my computed tomography rotation, the when you start from caudal, so more towards the feet, you'll see that it travels up, it joins the left renal vein, and the left renal vein will then drain into the right IVC and then travel up. A uh, normal course is not like that. Now the left renal vein in the patient that I image is actually retroaortic, which is another anatomic anomaly that doesn't occur in many patients. So not only was it a duplication, but it was also retroaortic. Now it is embryologic in origin, which means that you were born this way. <laughs> uh, there are mutations that occur or actually it's um, growth that doesn't go right. You have three pairs of veins that grow around the aorta when you are four to eight weeks in gestation. That's the posterior cardinal, subcardinal, supercardinal veins. They develop in succession on either side of the aorta. It's a very complicated multi-step um, development that actually I read a source that was like this thick on it. So we'll skip that and just say that what happens is regressions, which means that the veins grow in others, anastomosis, which they grow into each other, form your inferior vena cava. Now IVC anomalies reflect an abnormal regression or persistence of the various embryonic veins. Duplication of the IVC arises when you have a persistence of both supercardinal veins. Now, since the development of cross-sectional imaging, the congenital anomalies have been encountered more frequently in asymptomatic patients. They have known about IVC anomalies since the late 1700s, mainly due to autopsies. And when they would open people up, you would find the anomaly there in operations for organ transplant. They would open people who hadn't had imaging before and then there's this extra uh, vein. So that's when they would find it. So since cross-sectional anatomy was developed, we're able to see that not in dead people or people in surgery. So that actually is gonna help a lot in surgeries and planning of certain conditions. The familiarity with the anomaly, such as the duplication, is important. Imaging can help surgeons plan surgeries for retroperitoneal surgeries. Uh, angiographers, it will warn them of any potential complications before they actually get in there because you know those guys like to plan it step by step. It's very important to know that. So this is a huge aid in that. And most of the findings of IVC anomalies are just incidental. Patients are going for CT imaging and the radiologist will just see it but sometimes they misinterpret what they see. Anomalies of IVC, such as the duplication, can be misinterpreted as enlarged lymph nodes, um, retroperitoneal masses, aortic aneurysms, lymphadenopathy, cyst, or even just loops of small bowel that happen to just come up right there. A computerized tomogram or CT and magnetic resonance angiogram they are the best diagnostic modalities for identifying and mapping venous anomalies within the retroperitoneum. Basically when you have the best way is intravenous contrast with a CT. 
and that's going to of course show the contrast as it travels through the veins it'll highlight the duplicated IVC and they can recognize that this is going to help distinguish anomalies from pathologic conditions that I mentioned before such as if they think this person has an aortic aneurysm when it's just the way they were born <laughs> Ultrasound can also be used, but it's better for just initial staging. Obesity, bowel gas, they can actually cover up what a sonographer wants to see. And sonography is operator dependent. So you can have good sonographers and bad ones, people who are in a hurry, who don't want to rush. So sonography is not the best, but you can, it's a good start, especially with the color Doppler. Computed tomography is considered the gold standard for this imaging, and if you're familiar with how CT is, you have your gantry, which houses the x-ray tube and your detector array, the patient couch that moves the patient in and out of the tube, or the gantry, you have the console where you do your post-processing, processing, <laughs> then you have your protocol setups for your abdomen, you pick all that. And the way that it works is you have a stationary patient laying there, the couch is moving them in and out, and the x-ray tube rotates around the patient, and then this is a fixed ring. And that's how the CAT scans work. And they use the Hounsfield unit, which just talks about how different tissues attenuate the x-rays. The reference is water, which has a Hounsfield number of zero. The higher the Hounsfeld number, it moves from lighter gray to white as you move above zero. Less than zero is going to be darker gray to black. CT can create 3D images from the 2D image, which is multi-planar referation in axial, which is like you're looking down in the patient from above, coronal, which is through the patient, front to back, sagittal, which is from the side, and oblique views also. And this is the slice creation. It's going to move around the patient at different levels. And that creates images. Important there is pitch. That's going to be the couch movement and your slice thickness. And that's going to calculate the amount of the anatomy being examined during your scan. Uh, other terminology with CT is going to be your window width, window level, which adjusts your contrast and your brightness. Uh, you can use different windows with CT for tissue, lung, bone, depending on what you're wanting to focus on in your image. The volume element is information that's gathered that you can use to create the 3D from the pixel, which is your 2D element. The additional modalities used for IVC imaging is magnetic resonance, which is going to use your magnetic fields and your radio waves to mathematically reconstruct your image. There's no x-rays used in that, so it is a safer modality as far as patients go. Ultrasound, which we discussed, uses the high frequency waves, and it creates images of organs and structures in the body. And of course, there you can get dynamic studies. You can actually see movement in the, in the organs and the flow with the sono. You can also see that in magnetic resonance if they do angio angiograms. And here is the patient that we imaged. In this first image, what this arrow is pointing to, that's your aorta. This is your left kidney, and that is the vein traveling. Here's your aorta, and that's your renal vein. We're traveling down the patient. So this is above at the level of the renal veins. And here is your aorta, and that's where it's crossing behind the aorta, and that's the right IVC. And as you keep traveling down, or that's where it moved over there. You keep traveling down, this is your right inferior vena cava, your aorta, and the left one. So that's the duplicate. And that's the one that you wouldn't normally, you wouldn't see on a normal patient. And as you continue to move down, you'll see right aorta and then your left IVC. You keep moving down and you'll see that it continues and when radiologists are viewing these images it's this continuation of the vast what they call the vascular structure that will show them that this is indeed a duplicate IVC and not some other pathological 
anomaly. <laughs> Treatment for the duplication of the IVC, most are asymptomatic. You don't know if people have them. So there really normally is no treatment. Now if you have an incidental finding, then they start looking at, you know, if this patient needs something to be done, it can predispose you to thromboembolism. Most of the time though, people who end up with an embolism also have some kind of genetic predisposition, predisposition to embolism, and also they may take oral contraceptives and smoking, those can also, are secondary factors that you do to yourself that will predispose you to embolism. So the first thing they'll do is probably just observe the patient, especially if they're not at risk for an embolism. If they are, you can put filters in either system, which look, you know, kind of like that cage. Have you all ever seen that? They'll put it in there in an image. It catches the clot as it travels through the vein. Uh, coil immobilization of the segment plus a filter in the right one is also another treatment option for those patients. Since most are asymptomatic, the prognosis for these patients is great. <laughs> they can live their whole life and never know that this existed in their bodies. If they do come up with thromboembolism, you will want to treat them with anticoagulation therapy, which is something most people would be on their whole lives. And it is very controlled, and those people still have a good prognosis as long as they're not smoking and you remove the secondary factors like oral contraception, which can trigger the embolism from occurring. And these are my references. Thank you for listening.